Dr. Chris Bleeker. He will be talking about trauma and the bleeding patient an anesthesiologist perspective. Chris Bleeker is a consultant and anesthetist of Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen, Netherlands, a surgeon captain reserve Royal Netherlands in the Navy, former flight surgeon and head of RNL Aviation Medicine and main author, Definitive Anesthetic Trauma Care Course and Mission Anesthesiologist International Red Cross. Let us welcome Dr. Chris Bleeker. Dear colleagues, first of all, I would thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak at your conference. Uh, I'm very sorry I'm not uh, present in person in Singapore. I would love to be there. Um, I would also would not have minded to do this uh, online, but unfortunately I'm on a mission and uh, internet is really poor and I have to uh, do this as a recording for which I apologize. My name is Chris Bleeker. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm from the city of Nijmegen. Nijmegen is the oldest city in the Netherlands. It's about 750 years old. And it has a university hospital, the Radboud University Hospital. And it has about 900 beds. And we cover for the trauma region, uh, part of the Netherlands, and also a small part of Germany, Currently, the hospital looks like it's been hit by a bomb, but in reality, we're building a lot of new stuff and uh, we're trying to modernize everything there. Well, I've been asked to talk about uh, trauma and the bleeding patient. And I would like to talk especially about the bleeding part. As you are well aware, resuscitation over time has changed a lot. Uh, we now have the hypertensive resuscitation, we have the blood products in fixed ratios, the massive transfusion protocols, uh, tranexamic acid, and the current focus is on the trauma-induced coagulopathy, on which I would like to say a few more things and try and bring you up to date. Before 2003, we thought that coagulopathy was something induced by something from outside, like doctors. Stuff like dilution, hypothermia, and acidosis was considered to be causative of the coagulopathy. After 2003, research from, for instance, Karen Brohe showed that the acute trauma-induced coagulopathy was already present uh, on arrival of the patient. And the coagulopathy, defined as an INR of above 1.3, is associated with at least three to four times higher mortality rate more transfusions and more complications. These patients that were able to receive plasma, platelets and fibrinogen were better off. Well, trauma induces, uh, well, tissue damage and it uh, starts uh, immunological and hematological processes. As you can see here, the, uh, the pumps and the damps uh, and the hypoxia, which uh, uh, starts in there. And uh, you see this a very, very complex uh, system and I would like to refer you to the uh, nature review from uh, Marcus uh, from 2018, which tells this all. And I would like to focus especially on the uh, left side and talk a little bit about, uh, about this area uh, of the uh, coagulopathy. Coagulopathy requires both tissue injury and shock. It also appeared that the trauma severity score alone was not the most important factor. Shock, here defined as a base deficit of above six or a lactate of four or more in combination with the ISS predicts coagulopathy. The same is true for mortality. Despite the fact that the ATC is a dynamic entity and therefore no single hypothesis explains the different manifestations, I want to tell a bit about the supposed mechanisms accounting for it and the implications in the daily practice. Let's start with hemostasis, which refers to three different systems that usually are in balance. The procoagulant system, platelets, fibrinogen, and the main coagulation enzyme, thrombin, that with help from the platelet surface converts fibrinogen into fibrin. The anticoagulation system that prevents clotting, limits the clot size when clotting is needed. And finally, the fibrinolytic system, 
plasmin that breaks the clot down and its precursor plasminogen. TPA and its precursor, not surprisingly called plasminogen inhibitor one. Two major players control this balance, blood flow and endothelium. Where a procoagulant action of one part will be counterbalanced by anticoagulation reaction of the opposite part. Out of balance results in either bleeding or thrombosis. For the purpose of coagulation and anticoagulation, people have started looking at blood and the endothelium as a single organ, and they call it the blood organ. And this is a very sensitive to oxygen depth and is at risk for failing, having implications for all other organ systems. And this was summarized in 2011 by Holcomb in an editorial where he stated that acute traumatic coagulopathy can be regarded as oxygen death plus sympatico adrenal driven blood failure due to endothelial damage plus inflammation. We have about one kilo of endothelium, about four to seven thousand square meters, and this is mostly located in the microcirculation. And therefore, it is the microcirculation that links trauma to coagulopathy. Under normal physiological conditions, the endothelial surface maintains blood fluidity and regulates flow by multiple anticoagulant mechanisms. Perhaps not everybody is aware of the fact that endothelium is protected by one liter of glycocalyx, which can be thought of as an immobile plasma layer. It protects the endothelium, it is anticoagulant and profibrinolytic, and it prevents platelet and leukocyte adhesion. Together, endothelium and the glycocalyx are responsible for vascular integrity. The endothelium and a healthy glycocalyx are antithrombotic. They do not leak and the barrier separates the strong procoagulant subendothelial tissues from blood. A damaged glycocalyx leaks, is prothrombotic and in extreme situations is ripped off thereby releasing all its anticoagulant and profibrinolytic factors in the flowing blood. The catecholamine-induced damage to the endothelium is responsible for endothelial breakdown, resulting in glycocalyx shedding, breakdown of tight junctions with capillary leakage, and a procoagulant microvasculature that further reduces oxygen delivery due to increased tissue pressure and uh, microvascular uh, thrombosis, creating a vicious cycle that ultimately results in organ failure. The most severely injured trauma patients display evidence of endogenous heparinization as evaluated by whole blood thromboelastography. Now here's what happens in trauma. We have tissue injury modulated by the degree of hyperperfusion, triggers the immune system and evokes a sympathetical adrenal response. This damages the glycocalyx, leads to cytokine release, inflammation, thrombin generation, and platelet activation. And this in turn damages the glycocalyx further and converts the endothelium from an antithrombotic to a prothrombotic and leaky entity. Together with the resulting edema, this slows down the blood flow and at some point leads to oxygen death, further cell damage, and exhausted platelets, further impairment of local perfusion and reduced clearance of thrombin. Now, in order to keep the blood flowing and counterbalancing this procoagulant and inflammatory state, the damaged endothelium reacts by a cascade of events leading and driven by the thrombomodulin activated protein C pathway. Thrombin gets distracted and shuts down its normal procoagulant function. With increased injury severity, the glycocalyx is ripped off, releasing its anticoagulants thrombomodulin and active protein, protein C, heparin and profibrinolytics like TPA that stimulates fibrinolysis into circulation. Furthermore, new evidence indicates that reperfusion damages the fibrinogen and fibrin, thus making for weaker clots and increasing further coagulopathy. The induction of endotheliopathy of trauma by hemorrhage and trauma involves hypoxia, endothelial cell surface receptor activation by inflammatory mediators and growth factors. 
It involves the binding of platelets, red blood cells, and leukocytes to activated endothelial cells and the production of coagulation path intermediates. The degree of fibrinolysis is positively associated with mortality and likely proportionate to the degree of shock, even when it's not sufficient to induce whole blood clot lysis. Now, why is this important? Hemostatic resuscitation is neither hemostatic nor resuscitative in trauma hemorrhage. The message of this observation is simple. Giving matched red blood cells during the first day at best only partially corrects the lactate and not the coagulopathy. Whereas in animal studies, optimizing the microcirculation even without hemostatic therapy is able to correct the coagulopathy. Microcirculatory preservation is essential for patient recovery from hemorrhagic shock. In hemorrhagic shock, microcirculatory flow and pressures are greatly reduced, creating an oxygen debt that may eventually become irreversible. During shock, tissue becomes hypoxic, cellular respiration turns to anaerobic metabolism, and the microcirculation rapidly begins to fail. And this condition requires immediate fluid resuscitation to promote tissue reperfusion. The choice of fluid for resuscitation is whole blood. So much for theory. Now, is the patient bleeding? What is the bleeding? How do I stop it? Can I stop it? Is there already coagulopathy? But this is not simple. Because as you can see, all possibilities are there. And even within the individual patient, the situation can change rapidly. So we want to know what is the hemostatic capacity of the patient now? And this we will have to measure. And we have a choice for how we will measure. The old way, plasma-based coagulation tests like the APTT, the PT, the INR or the fibrinogen, they're slow and you get the results after some time. They're static. They only measure the time needed to start fibrin formation. The initiation phase of the coagulation where only 5% of the relevant thrombin is formed, but they don't monitor further the kinetics and stability of the clot formation, but they are solid. You know what you get. You have an INR of above 1.5 to 1.8. It predicts that the factor 5 and 8 are less than 30% and they correlate well with microvascular bleeding. And then we have the new tests like the TEG and the Rotum in whole blood. They're fast. You can get an answer within 5 to 10 minutes. They're functional because not only do they assess the time to start fibrin formation, but also they monitor the clot strength and the stability the main problems in the ATC. So people were very enthusiastic about this viscoelastic testing and they wanted to see what uh, the outcome would change with uh, use of this uh, kind of testing uh, compared to the old testings. And they started this trial, the uh, ITACTIX, uh, which is by now uh, finished and given us the results. So now the results of itactics are in. There are no major differences uh, in the primary endpoints between the viscoelastic way of testing and the old fashioned way of uh, testing. However, the viscoelastic group uh, used 1.8 times more blood products, fibrinogen uh, and uh, other products than the CCT group with no benefit in the proportion of patients alive and free of massive transfusion at 24 hours after injury or in any of the other secondary mortality outcomes. So why is the patient bleeding? Is it lack of thrombin? Is it lack of fibrinogen? Is it a lack of platelets? Well, usually it is not thrombin. Whether or not plasma was given, the pro-thrombin levels were never below 50%. And the same is true, but not shown here, for the other vitamin K dependent clotting factors. Well, fibrinogen. Coagulopathic patients have lower fibrinogen levels, below 2 gram per liter to begin with. Low levels of fibrinogen are associated with bleeding and mortality at 24 hours and 28 days. And there's a wide variability in fibrinogen concentration in patients on admission. In 1133 patients, 8% uh, 
arrived with a fibrinogen below 1.5 gram per liter, and 19% arrived with a fibrinogen level of below 2 grams per liter. A non-linear relationship between fibrinogen on arrival and mortality was observed with a breakpoint at 2.29 gram per liter, and an increased mortality below and above this value. Should we correct to this value? We don't know yet. So during resuscitation, fibrinogen is the first thing to drop, and it continues to drop as can be seen in the picture. And there are no fibrinogen stores that can be mobilized. Fibrinolysis occurs in 80% of patients with severe trauma, yet because of the relative intensity of TEG and Rotom, it is only visible if antiplasmin levels are severely depleted below 75% of normal, and hence detected in only 5 to 10%. However, hyperfibrinolysis that is diagnosed in TEG or Rotom is frequently lethal and carries a mortality rate of 60 to 100%. A normal platelet count is not the same as an adequate platelet function. And the importance of possible platelet dysfunction in trauma is little understood. Platelets contain factor V, an important cofactor for thrombin generation, and it's more resistant to the cleavage by activated protein C, and factor 13, which is important for the stabilization of the fibrin clot. Early platelet transfusion is associated with improved outcome in the acutely bleeding trauma patient. Platelet concentrations clearly contribute to hemostasis by increasing thrombin formation, increasing clot stiffness, and increasing resistance to clot lysis. Platelets are also a rich source of protein, which may confer a degree of fibrinolytic protection by inhibition of TPA. The treatment of bleeding is to stop the bleeding. Permissive hypertension until hemostasis and minimizing the time from injury to definitive surgery. You're all familiar with the principles of hemostatic resuscitation. Early preemptive balanced transfusion therapy, goal-directed administration of coagulation factor concentrates instead of plasma and platelets. And then the Copenhagen concept, which combines the both. And this is the current way of doing things. Here you see some of the positive aspects of plasma, it stabilizes the pro-anticoagulant and fibrinolytic equilibrium. It modulates the immunoinflammatory cascade, and maybe it even restores the glycocalyx. So don't drown the patient, giving plasma to do so with enough fibrinogen. And keep in mind that within a very short period, uh, between six and uh, 48 hours, the patient may change from a hypocoagulation situation to a hypercoagulation situation, and he will need anticoagulants to keep his blood flowing. Well, here are the key messages. The right patient to the right center. Measure and monitor the coagulation and initiate uh, resuscitation, goal-directed as soon as possible. Damage control approach to surgical interventions. Be aware of the potential thrombotic risk and pretreatment with anticoagulation agents, particularly in the older patient. Adhere to local treatment protocols because they serve as a cornerstone of quality improvement. Two thirds of patients who die after major trauma do so as a result of causes other than exsanguination. Oxygen debt and the ability to correct it determine not only fibrin clot formation in the acute phase, but also complications later on. This is a schematic which shows what I've been talking about. We have the injury and blood loss, shock, and endotheliopathy, leading to coagulopathy, leading to blood failure, leading to an increased mortality. Uh, I leave you with this device that I stumbled on during my uh, search. Um, it's a cell salvage machine which salvages both uh, erythrocytes and platelets um, with a high recovery uh, uh, percentage and also it uh, uh, maintains the integrity and the function of these cells. I think this will warrant uh, our attention for uh, the future. I'd like to thank you again for, uh, for having me and uh, for listening to my presentation. 
and I hope to uh, be with you in the, in the flesh uh, the next time. Thank you very much.